But while I was doing that four times eight minute at a hundred percent FTP, I was like swearing at myself and like, you know, FTP <laughs> is an effing illusion. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. You've got to talk is... to your coach there, Jerry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's Good afternoon, everybody. Episode 44 of uh, Cycling Talk, Lowland Cycling. It's uh, February 26th today, um, around 5 o'clock in the uh, the afternoon, Sunday. And what a lot of racing uh, past week and especially this weekend. The classic seasons had uh, started off um, and it did not disappoint. How are you guys doing? We've got the whole team here. Uh, Stuart, did you do any uh, any racing uh, this weekend, riding yourself? Yeah, yeah, I went with uh, with Jeff to an event up in um, Flemington, New Jersey, called the Sourland Semi Classic, and uh, the debate of whether it is a road ride or a gravel ride started when I picked up Jeff, and <laughs> I uh, had my road bike, and he had his gravel bike totally ready. Um, we loaded up, pulled out, quick chatted, went back into the driveway, went up, got his road bike, and uh, and continued on. Um, so we rode rode the event on our road bikes. Um, there was definitely some deep gravel there. Um, I got a sidewall slash uh, that I was able to seal up with orange seal and uh, some CO two, but it was a was a fun day. Oh, okay. And how many how many miles is it in total? Uh, Fifty eight miles, about. 4,000 feet of climbing, I'd say maybe about, Jeff, what would you say, 10 miles of gravel? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's uh, a, a fun event. They technically have a neutral rollout um, and kind of a, a rolling start anytime between about 9 and 10. Um, but we rolled out with probably about 30 of us or so. And uh, starts off with a, some gravel along a road or along a river. And the first serious climb that splits things up is around mile 16 or so. Um, and then it kept on getting whittled down till at one point it was me, Jeff, and one other guy were the only, only three left from about our 30 man group. And he, the other guy was waiting for somebody else. Um, so he kind of turned around and went back for his buddy and Jeff and I, rode for a long while together and um, just conversational pace at that point while we were kind of waiting for the the rest of the group to come back up to us and came back up. Uh, what was it? Five people came back up to us at that point and two, two of which were ladies and they were moving the ladies. It was impressive yeah. uh, okay. because the guys they were with were very strong and were putting the hurt on me and Jeff. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then um, eventually one of them got a flat and then it was me and Jeff for about the final 20 miles and yeah, had a fun day. Um, averaged right around 19, 20 miles an hour, uh, pushed hard and had fun. Right. Yep. Yeah. The only bummer was we got back to the car and we missed the KOM for the whole race by two minutes. And we were like, <laughs> ah, we could have oh. like the flat, you know, mm, we, yeah. we, we yep. were waiting and it was like, if we had, we known if we'd kept motoring, we would have easily taken it. But there was like a traffic light where there was a lot of traffic and, you know, we, maybe we could have cut across the road sooner or something. There was another time where we stopped waiting for those guys. And like, I took a jacket out of my pocket and put it on while we were hoping they would come back up to us. So we didn't have to do 40 miles by ourselves and um, hindsight. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah it, it was two, a fun two minutes day. is nothing. You should, you could have easily come that, uh, that, that KOM. Yeah. 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 But the the guy who said it, you know, good on him. Uh, he, from what I could tell, was was by himself. Actually, Jeff, it was the other guy in there in orange who oh, okay. was eating pizza when we were in there. He set the fastest time of like three hours and seven minutes for 58 miles. Okay. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's 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 doable, right? Yeah. 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 So that was it was windy ride. and it yeah. was cold. I mean, yeah, when we started, it was, started, it was, yeah, it was out windy. there. It was much yeah. colder than it was here. Uh, when we got out of my car, my car was saying it was 28 degrees. Um, there was about 100%. It was like we were in a cloud, the humidity there. Um, so it was a pretty pretty brutal start. But um, after about an hour or so, we were pretty warm. Right. Mm -hmm. right. How about you guys? You get out to ride? 
Um, I got out today. Yesterday, I Great. went out and uh, rode. Actually, I rode with Jerry on Zwift yesterday. We nice. did. Uh, we did. Uh, was it? What's the name of that route, Jerry? The the full route of Scotland. And I think we both we both rode for about two hours or so. Right. So awesome! It, yeah. it was great. Yeah, it was good. And today I did brave the uh, brave the elements. Today got out you know, about fifty miles. Felt good. Group of about five guys. We had a great time. Great. Right. It's yeah, funny, I, you know. After after you know, last you know, on Thursday when it was seventy degrees, it's just so yeah. hard mentally to get all of the gear back on for winter weather but you have to realize it's still only february so you know it, we're going to have some cold weather yet so i got to get back into the swing of things saying it's okay to ride in cold right yeah, yeah. it's hard yeah I, st I stayed inside it was um we actually had uh somebody over from the it's a nephew from my from my wife's side and uh he actually lives in ghent uh, mm. so i said what are you doing here right <laughs> mm -hmm. the classic season is starting and they're literally starting in ghent so <laughs> uh, but he had he was here for work in baltimore um you know i was doing some research for a university but uh, um so that kind of limit my uh, my time on the on on the bike but you know i did a did a workout today and um it was it was a four times eight um at a hundred percent ftp and you know I, I coach a lot of people but while i was doing that four times eight minute at 100 percent ftp i was like swearing at myself and like you know ftp <laughs> is an effing illusion yeah right? yeah, yeah. Hey, you've got to talk is... to your coach there jerry <laughs> yeah exactly it's like uh yeah that's that's the thing you know every, it, it's how, how should I put it? So FTP is a great number. It's just one indicator, right? Of how are you doing? And I'm making progress, but it's, you know, it's, it's, um, overvalued number. Um, um, so for a lack of better metrics, if you don't have anything else, sure. FTP does have his place in, in getting better, but it's most certainly not, I, I won't, I, it's, you would be pretty unique if you truly could do your FTP for a full hour. And that's what they say, right? It's your functional mm -hmm. threshold power, which you should be able to do a, a full hour. I don't think a lot of people can actually do that. Well, I think I've seen studies where where you can't, even the pros. The pros averaged, I believe, in the study that they did 51 minutes at FTP. Yeah. And it decreased from there. So, you know, we're... As you know, season cyclists, we're probably in the forty range or yep. thirty range or whatever. But you know, the average person that goes in and does an FTP test can probably only hold it for twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. So, and that's what I see in the in the data for the people that I coach. Mm -hmm. um, the the value that I look at is the TTE, the time to exhaustion, um, and that's usually around that that forty minute mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um if somebody is in really good shape and training for you know further in the season so they have that that toughness um they might get to 44 maybe <laughs> uh, but between you know 35 and 44 that's that that's really all that i all that i see um and that's uh so you know i was thinking about that so <laughs> um but uh yeah so that, that was my training um and in the meanwhile, I was, you know, doing watching a lot of the of the racing. Um, so so let's let's start there. Um, we had a stage race, like we said in uh, the, the the UEE tour tour, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Stuart, I think you saw quite a lot of that, that yeah. race. Yeah, I tried to watch it. Um, I wake up around 4.35 a.m. every day. I don't want to, trust me, but I do. Um, it's terrible. Anywho, the good thing is that race starts around 5.50 every day, so I got to watch a lot of it. And um, the first stage specifically was one of the most incredible sprints. It was between uh, Merlier and Ewan. Um, the stage in general was a fun one the first day. There was mm -hmm. a lot of crosswinds. People mm -hmm. got broken up. Um, Plop specifically from uh, Ineos Grenadiers, the Australian national champ. He was one of the few that was able to cross the uh, yes, echelon from one echelon to another. Mm -hmm. Definitely put that TT prowess to uh, to use there. But the the finish 
between Merlier and Ewan was so close that I mean, I don't know how they how they said that Tim actually won because really when, when you're looking at it, I think it was Robbie McEwen was announcing as well. He was saying, I can't call it. I've never seen a race this close. And it was reminded me of that Milan San Remo between Pidcock and Van Art where they gave it to Van Art, but it was one of those races where everyone was like, who actually won? And that's exactly how stage one was. Very, very fun to watch. Um, stage two was a team time trial. It's been a long time since we've seen that. That was a 17.3 kilometer stage, quick step one by one second. Mm-hmm. And uh, they mm-hmm. do have the world's worst helmets. Although, did you guys see Uno <laughs> X's helmets? Uno X's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about so, that a little like, bit later. Gosh. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so they won by one second. So, you know, as much as we're we're joking uh, at the expense of the way these guys look with these ridiculous uh, helmets, it's got it's to do like, something. It's like, it's like the movie Spaceballs. And exactly. Vader, yes, right? yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I think the um, surprise of the TTT was that uh, EF held the lead for so yes, long. Totally. I mean, that was surprising. EF's really stepped it up this year. And I think that's a good example of it. They seem to have a lot of fun. Yes. Their their guys are always always yeah. uh yeah, always smiling and having a good time. And I think that goes a long way. Mm-hmm. Um stage three was a mountaintop. It was the first mountaintop of the race. Uh Rubio from Movistar ended up winning that stage pretty handily. He went with a few kilometers to the finish and it looked like a pretty bold move. Uh, he held on to it and ended up winning. Remco came in second and with the time bonus he got, he ended up taking over the lead there. Um, that was a, that was a, another fun one to watch. Um, right. Stages That's four. And Pleb, and Pleb um, you know, as young as he is, he's mm-hmm. 20, 22 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, he came in fifth. Um, so, you know, that was, you know, I, I'm very impressed with the guy. So he's uh, he's a super strong, great pickup by, by, by Ineos. Yeah, you're right. You're totally right. Now, Jeff and I today were talking about that as well. I mean, even the way he won this year's national championship, mm-hmm. um, as I recall, it was a circuit and he kept getting drifted off and... You know, he kept on battling back, getting back into that lead group, and he did that final descent. He got back into the lead group, but didn't let up. It went with like two or three K left. And even though he was looked apparently the weakest one there, he went. Everybody hesitated. And again, you know, being a time trialist, he uh got the got the national champion, was that second year in a row. Um yeah, yeah he's a fun, fun racer to watch. Um Stage four, five, and six were all flat stages. They were won by uh, Sebastian Milano from UAE, Dylan Grunewagen, and then uh, stage six was Tim Miller. Uh, my apologies in advance for butchering their names. Uh, Jerry, maybe <laughs> you're the one who should be announcing their names <laughs> as I'm uh, Chris Hornering it over here. <laughs> Uh, then stage seven, uh, that definitely was a fun one. It was another mountaintop finish. And... Um, Man, it was awesome to see Yates get out there and really put it yes. to Remco. He was able to drop Remco. Um, then there was the AG2R guy. I believe it was Bouchard who was in third. And then Sepp Kuss, the American, was in fourth. Um, but yeah, it was it was another fun one. Good to see Yates get out there and uh, take the win on that one. And um, Remco took the overall with Plop behind and 59 seconds behind. Yates at one minute. Man, Plop mm. and Yates being one second apart. And uh, Peo Bill Bao was only a minute uh, 03, so he was three seconds. So to have second, third, and fourth be within four seconds, pretty awesome race. Yeah. And that, that last stage is uh, starting to get a little bit iconic, right? It's mm. it's flat for 140 Ks. Um, and then, you know, it's just that, that mountain. It kicks up. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that picks yeah. up and it's, uh, yeah. um, uh, and again, it's, it's a beautiful road. It's almost like riding on the, on the, you know, four lane highway. And, and they just, you know, the, the first K or two, they fly up that hill. Um, and then, you know, that it, it thin, thins out quite quickly. And, mm-hmm. you know, you will end up with a, with an epic, uh, battle most of the times and yep. uh this year was the was the same but it's just uh super flat and then boom there you mm-hmm. have the uh Jebel Havid that's the mountain that's mm-hmm. yeah, pretty nice. 
it does show the difference with, with it shows what gradient does because Jebel Jace is a much longer climb and, and certainly vertically too. Um, but it's a diesel climb. There's, you know, it's, it maybe maxes out at 9%, but it averages more like five to 6% for the right. duration of it, where Jebel Hafit is a much, much steeper climb and it uh, is much more conducive to attacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was it was great to see Yates um, do that attack and put Remco to the sword. And um, Jeff and I were talking about just the speed that Yates was approaching the finish. He was he was flying. It was really really fun to watch. Um, mm. Then we had a few other races going on. Uh, um, obviously the big ones, but before we get to them, we had the Gran Camino in Spain. Mm-hmm. Uh, quite unusual. There was a lot of snow over there. Stage one. Um, ended up getting um, neutralized with about 20 kilometers left. Um, Vinigo went on to win the remainder of the stages and in pretty dominant fashion. Um, and yeah, he ended up taking the overall as well. But uh, he is on form and we'll talk about it a little bit more. But Yumbo Visma is on form. Um, For sure. Yeah. <laughs> so then. And, 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 you know, to stick around with that race a little mm-hmm. bit more. You know what? What I found impressive was, you know, obviously the the mountain stages, but he basically took off three. The one race was three kilometers before you know, below yeah. the top, and the other one was two kilometers below the top. So that just shows a ton of confidence in, like, okay, he's probably looking at his power meter and thinking, I got at least fifty watts to spare. Mm-hmm. I'm going, <laughs> right? Yeah. And he yeah. just rides away from the others. You're right. I mean, it looked like he was mouth breathing when right. everyone else was just on the rivet, just barely able to do anything. And then when he went, everyone was just like, are you kidding me? Like, right. you're gone. See ya. It was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. Every year, just seems to get better and better um I, i've been watching road racing all kinds of racing um for a couple of decades now and yes you had epic races and you have epic battles but you know the the talent is there, there's this you know there's a, a a top 10 maybe a top five that's you know a little bit above the rest or maybe a lot above the rest but it's 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 so much broader uh than it than it was in the in in the past and i think it's just amazing and you know they they go for it every every race it's it's very very exciting racing i heard somebody talk about how that changed with the pandemic how that mentality of we might not race tomorrow literally um it seems like it started a bit before that but that seems to have really helped and it's made it more fun for all of us yeah absolutely yeah there's a whole I wouldn't say controversy, but um, in the podcast, the, the, the Lance Armstrong, the Move podcast, uh, Joe and Bernil. And by the way, Lance Armstrong hasn't been on the last two or three podcasts. So for the listeners, if you're looking for the, the Move podcast, Lance is in the show. So, <laughs> you know, <Sorry>. yeah, <laughs> you're doing it with uh, Bernil and uh, two other guys. But uh, <laughs> anyways, um, um, he, the, Bernil was, was talking about you know, Pogachar isn't it too, too soon? Why is he doing this already? You know, there's no need for doing it. And, you know, the people, you know, the Brunil with his history with Lance Armstrong and the US Postal, they were basically saying, look, look who's talking, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Are you really allowed to say something about how, how anybody else is, you know, preparing their season and, and, uh, um, uh, racing? So, uh, but, you know, obviously, I, you know, time will tell. Um, these guys are so young, and maybe in five years from now or six years from now, uh, they're completely washed out and burnt all their matches. But you know, we had four or five years of really exciting racing, <laughs> right? And you they know, Jerry, absolutely th- wrote history. So, you yeah, know, yeah, th- that's a really interesting point you said because. Uh, Lance Armstrong was about when I got into cycling. Eva wasn't riding, but I started watching it. I was probably 12, 13 years old. What was that? Oh, 99, um, 98. And from what I've heard before that, you know, riders would 
pretty much try to win mm-hmm. every race all year round. Right. Um, then it seemed like Lance really changed it to you peak for one, maybe two events a year, and that's it. Um, it's good to see it kind of going back to the more traditional way, I guess it used to be right. of how, mm-hmm. you know, we expect Joan, Jonas Vindigo and, uh, and Taddy to be winning now and to be winning, you know, come the end of the season. Right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. But Bernou, Bernil bring, brought up a good point, which is like, it's not just, uh, Pugacar, right. That's, that's getting burned out. He's burning out his teammates too. So, yeah. you know, he, he may have the legs and stuff, but these guys have to be, you know, on point in July. And uh, if they're wasting energy now, that's just going to take away from their efforts later on in the season. That's why they keep on picking up more more people to, on yeah. their team. <laughs> bigger, they now have teams. Yates, they have Vine, yeah. they've got Bilbao. You know, they keep on going and keep on need to get more and more guys on their team. I guess yeah. maybe that's good. Maybe the rosters will expand. Yeah. Instead of a twenty on a team, yeah. there'll be thirty or forty, right? Yeah, but but that that is a fair point, right? If you're, you know, if, if Pogachar is basically riding at eighty percent, and the other ones have to, you know, do the lead-ins, get the bottles, you know, get them out of the wind, but they are constantly riding at ninety-five uh, uh, percent. Um, yeah, they will burn out earlier in the season than uh, mm-hmm. than than he will. So where where will his team? Um, then end up um, but that's that's probably a good segue in you know talking about teams <laughs> there, mm-hmm. is, there is a certain p- team in the peloton that's uh, you know dominated the weekend uh, of, of of classics who, who would like to go ver- first on uh, uh, Jeff Jack do you uh, any any thoughts starting with the uh, omloop head news blood um, mm-hmm. the first race on Saturday yeah, so that was an amazing finish. Um, what was insane is that this is Dylan Van Barl who, who won. Right. This is his seventh win, and that's that's it. But he he's won Perry Roubaix. He's won. <laughs> I mean, if if you could choose races to win, and, yep. and you're not bad, huh? Yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> this is and with his new team so right i was really... going to say and his first race with his new team so mm-hmm. speaking yeah. of picking up good uh, good talent yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah just an amazing finish you know mm-hmm. yeah yeah so last year he won paris roubaix and um uh, he came in second um in tour de flanders mm-hmm. that's where you know yep uh, pokachar <laughs> was away with uh, Mathieu van der poel and Mathieu van der poel just was dropping the speed you know, with a couple of hundred meters to go because he wants to start from a really low speed. And three other guys came up amongst, you know, uh, one of them was uh, Dylan van Baarle. And uh, uh, Pogacar got boxed in and Mathieu van der Poel won the, won the sprint. Um, mm-hmm. And Pogacar got fifth. Uh, yeah, Michael yeah, so, right, right. Yeah, yes, was, yes, <laughs> yes. He was not amused. Yeah, he was uh, not happy. <laughs> yeah. uh, he was not happy. Yeah. But but yeah. yeah, talking a little bit about the race itself, uh, uh, Stuart. What 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 did you think about uh, about the tactics? I, I think you know Jumbo, hundred k before yeah finish. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, uh, so, so we were talking about it between Umloop and Kearns. Uh, Jerry and I were are uh, on opposite sides, so it's probably good for the listeners. Um, <laughs> I honestly, I think these solo breakaways, as impressive as they are, they're they're a little bit more boring for me to watch. Um, but man, the strength that he showed, it was, it was impressive. And to do that, it's, it's incredible. Um, you know, so hats off to him. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate. I know Ben Turner ended up crashing out and yes. breaking his elbow. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were a few others. Um, there was actually um, the, the young guy on Lotto who hung on to him. Um, I think it was Dali who, yes. who hung on I mean, Really, I think he was in the breakaway. Then he got mm-hmm. picked up and hung with him. That was really impressive to see. Um, but at the end of the day, man, Dylan was on fire. Yeah, yeah. To go forty k on your own is just just amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there, there weren't any closer coming any closer. And you know, he he has a a, a huge engine. Um, mm-hmm. He's he's a fairly good time trialist, uh, but he he just sets the pace and just keeps on going and. Uh, he, he is really, you know, if you think about a diesel, um, usually he just warms up when he does 200K. So with a race which was 207K, that's normally where he gets started, you know, mm-hmm. if you're there, right? So he's really for 
Paris Roubaix, um, uh, Tour de Flanders. That, that those are his races, but he's uh, he's shown um, some some epic uh, um, form already. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the young guy, you know, he's twenty years old, super impressive. Um, mm -hmm. I, I saw some some data analysis. He he did so the race was about five hours. So his um, uh, net power was three hundred fifty three watts. <laughs> for the five Man. hours five <laughs> hours Man. oh my gosh yeah and... i did 235 today for three <laughs> like, yeah. oh man i'm, I'm awesome right. yeah, exactly. and we almost I'm set the not. kom <laughs> right. yeah you almost set the kom <laughs> <laughs> and uh then his his uh his his, his sprint values or co going up these uh these these short climbs those values were were epic too so you know it in the pro peloton, if you really want to participate, you have to be able to do six watts per kilogram for 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 a long period. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're, you're just not going to cut it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, you know that's just just for the listeners yep. to put things in perspective. If you're riding at three watts on on Swift, and your uh, you know your rack, uh, your your legs are being ripped off, you know, double that, and and you'll be able to do that in the in the peloton. <laughs> Jerry, you just dashed my hopes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, another Yumbo guy, Christoph Laporte, he ended yes. up in third. Um, Christoph Alexander, or Alexander Christoph, coming in fourth. It was good to see the old man represent. Uh, but then Pidcock right there in fifth. Um, I know he was a lot of people's pre-race favorites. Um, it's impressive. Pidcock's a little guy. To see him be able to hold his own in a sprint finish like that against the likes of Alexander Christoph and Christoph Laporte. I mean, David Ballerini, Niels Pollitt, that's who came in seventh. You know, to see him right there as a little person, I'm only 5'6", you know, 145. So I, I get it. I can't imagine bumping elbows with those guys or having the power to be there. It's um, it's impressive. Right. Pitcock is interesting. So I, 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 I really like him. So I, I hope he does well. That he does better. But but yesterday he 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 wasn't there yet. And uh, you know, his goal was basically to be there from the beginning until the end of the spring season. So hopefully he has another level that he can get to, mm. right? Because you know, otherwise he's not going to be able to hang with uh, Bout van Aert and, mm -hmm. and Van der Poel and, and Pogacar um, if he doesn't find that that other level. And that, you know, he basically offered his cyclocross season to to be ready for the for the spring classics. And you know, yesterday wasn't wasn't it. And mm -hmm. and maybe it has to do with Jumbo Visma's um, strategy, right? Going at a hundred k. Uh, because his team had to chase. He was, he was, you know, if you if you think about that picture in your, you know, the, the Ineos team was pulling for a long time, and he was in third or fourth position um, in 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 that small train chasing uh, the Jumbo Visma riders that were up the road, um, and that that was at a hundred k. So that you know, um, that that strategy is working, I guess. <laughs> um, so. You had um, Matteo Jurgensen came in 18th, um, and Magnus Sheffield, Sheffield in 22nd. 22nd. Yeah, so yeah, it's fairly good. Um, mm -hmm. They will they will get there. Um, yeah. Anything else on? Uh... And then we had the ladies' race, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, which was interesting too. Um, you know the Jumbo Visma of the ladies team is uh, seems to be uh, SD works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? They were very very strong. Uh, anybody saw anything about about that race? I just watched the highlights. I didn't see the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of I watched a bit of it. I did didn't strong. watch. Uh, yeah. They they didn't have as much coverage as I recall when I turned on. Uh, the coverage started around like twenty k or so. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Lotto Capecchi, she won super strong. I mean, she was what second at Worlds last year. She was second at Roubaix last year. Um, so she's been right there. It's uh, good to see her get the win because she is very strong. And she went away. Um, I don't know the exact kilometers she went away, but she had a strong solo win. Yeah. 
and she she bridged up to the one movie star who was in the in in the lead um and she got somebody else uh georgie pfeiffer, pfeiffer um uh, but she dropped them one by one um on the i believe it was the the bosberg um a little bit you know um yeah i think you're much right gradient yeah. and uh, she she rode away from them so it was very very impressive um and then you basically had uh, her teammates in the chasing group just being very disturbing um and and, and rightfully so um and her uh, teammate uh, uh Lorena Wiebes which i also find very impressive because she's a pure sprinter she's a huge sprinter yeah yeah <laughs> um and she came in uh, came in second um she, you know but but she yeah. did a lot of cycle cross as well so that's yeah. got to help yeah. even if you're a pure sprinter um because i know the first couple of sprint races that um weepers did she didn't win she won one of them but i, I know she was beaten by dsm i think twice yeah. um you know, so I wonder if she was willing to sacrifice her sprint to become a better all arounder, and that's why she was doing a lot more cross this winter. I, I think I think there is absolutely truth in that. Yeah, I think she the the the, the pure raw sprint power. I think she offered up a little bit to be you know um, to to be able to hang on 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 these shorter climbs in in the spring classics. Uh, um, I, th I think that's that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and then today we had uh, Brussel Kuhne Brussel, which you know was almost like a blueprint of yesterday, slightly different. Uh, but Jumbo Visma just taking off with six guys. <laughs> um, I think it was not a hundred k. I think it was ninety four k or ninety two k before the before the finish. Yep, and uh, they. They they and, and I saw the the pre race interviews. You know their main goal was to drop uh, Fabio Jakobson, uh, Arnaud de Lee, um, and one of two other sprinters because Kerner Brussel Kerner is is usually ends up in a in, it's 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 not a big peloton but you know usually a bunch sprint of 40, 50 guys, um, and uh, their goal was to drop these guys as quickly as possible, um, and and they did. Yeah, it was a really exciting race. Um, ended up with, I think it was five off the front. Um, and there were, were I, I know at one point there were three Yumbo Vismas. Jan Tracknik ended up dropping off. And it was um, Teich Banut and Van Hoydonk were the two Yumbo Visma guys, along with Matty Mahorich. And who else was in that group? Um, Tim Wellens. Taco. Yep, Taco, and Taco yeah. Vanderhorn, uh, my, <laughs> yeah. my favorite guy in the Peloton, Taco. Yeah, yeah I uh, never heard of Taco until today, and then Stuart's telling me all about him, and now I'm like his biggest fan. I love this guy, Taco. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so for those who don't know, Taco's uh, um, that is his real name, Taco Vanderhorn. He's from the Netherlands, is that right, yes, Jerry? Correct. And yeah. he's one of the guys who kind of has been arrow is everything for some yes. years. Uh, you know, he's he's one of those guys who would run the most narrow handlebars he possibly could, mm -hmm. and then. It's his hoods are way down them and then way in. So he's mm -hmm. just super, super arrow. Um, pays pays dividends, but he's also a smart rider. He's almost always in breakaways. Breakaway. He knows how to find him. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so it's fun to see him in there as well. Um, yeah, and then they all worked really, really well together. And then it got down to the final couple K. They had almost a minute gap, and it was pretty obvious that it was going to be one of them. And um Tish and Van Hoydonk, they were kind of playing the one-two card. Um, Tish looked like he was tying up the whole time and really looked like he didn't have much left. Um, but he went at the right time with under a K left. They were all kind of looking at each other, and he was on the back, and he went. And everybody hesitated, just that one split second. And as soon as there was a gap, he he kept on going. And um, great to see. He's yeah, a fun impressive. rider to watch. It's impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what? What really caught my eye was um, uh, Peter Sagan. He was in that. You know, when they took off initially, he was in that group, uh, but he didn't last very long. Maybe after five or ten, one of these climbs, he got got dropped immediately, and it was like he was like, "Just park the brakes. <laughs> I'm I'm done." And uh, 
you know, if you think about Peter Sagan, I, you know, such an amazing writer. He was in his era. He was basically, you know, the the Van der Poel, Van Aert, Olive mm-hmm. uh, Leap, uh, you know, from from ten years ago. And you know, he, he yeah, he he couldn't hang with with this this bunch um, riding up to, uh, up that hill. Um, I, I was I was rooting for him. It would be cool to to have him, you know, at least be competitive and uh you know in the in deep in the finals but uh unfortunately uh, not yet hopefully mm-hmm. yeah i mean he he's 33 and how long has he been racing at this level when he turned pro before that he was still one of the most touted um cyclists out there so there is something what we were saying before about you know racing as hard as Peter raced. We're seeing now the young guys. Um, right. I mean, MVDP yeah. is yeah. already starting to to weaken. His back can't ha- hack it anymore. Right. Um, I know one of my good friends, Ryan Stanky. He and I always have the battle. Stanky is a huge MVDP fan. I'm a huge Wout fan, and uh, you know, for a long time, I mean, if you look at the resumes, you know, Matthew definitely has the better resume, but um. I don't know how much longer Matthew can go. That's a whole nother topic unto itself. Yeah, exactly. yeah. With regards to Peter, you know, it's when these guys race as hard as they do it, it's got to hurt your body. And how yeah, long can you really soul. do it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right, right. And it's, it, it, and so one is, is, is your body, right? Um, <clears throat> and I, and I think we, we spoke about that in earlier podcast. If you just think about, a rider being complete um, and maybe more talented. I think Wout van Aert is, has that, but then Van der Poel, just his his mentality and you know, mind over matter, <clears throat> um, killer instinct, which I also believe Peter Sagan has, uh, but that's coming at a cost, right? <laughs> so, and how how long can you be that focused? And, mm-hmm. and that you know, willing to sacrifice everything, um, and I think that that you know went against Peter Sagan at some point, and he just was not able to, you know, put in the hours and you know, a couple of injuries, you know, um, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, um, same. I don't know. Same with with Chris Froome, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Obviously, a horrible, horrible accident, but he's he's not he's not able to get back anymore. Um, and yep. you know. That ship with with new talents has sailed, mm-hmm. um, and then you are you know a little little over thirty, and you know you're not you're not able to catch up anymore. That's it, yeah. And he, and you know yeah. the the injuries play a big part of it. Yeah. Um, I know I've had my fair share of injuries, and every time you come back from one, it it takes a lot because you know you were right about here, and then you're injured, you're down here, so you bust your butt so hard to get back to that level. Yeah. You know, it's hard to get back there. And when it does, you have to spend so much more energy and mental energy, physical, that it it takes a lot more out of you. Um, right. Yeah. You overcompensating, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's also what I see with, you know, people that I coach is they busy at work, you know, kids bring the flu home or a cold and they're they're out for a couple of days. And, you know, the the, the worst technique you can do is to get, back on your bike too early and overcompensate because you want to make up, you need to make up, right? It's a must. You have to do it. And that's basically, you know, only contributing to putting your deeper in the hole um, mm-hmm. instead of being patient and, and you know, really make sure that it's out of your system. But again, that that's a whole other topic uh, <laughs> podcast by it uh, by itself. Um so yeah, um, um, and, you know the final thing, uh, two things actually that I wanna wanted to add. If, if you look at uh, Tismanot, Taco van der Hoor, Mahoric, van Hooydonk, Tim Wellens, these are all engines. These are guys that are well known for just being able to sustain that speed. So you know when they rode away, I thought you know that's going to be so hard for for the peloton to to pick back up. And at some point they they got organized. You had the um, or was it the uh, the, the Lotto team and uh, mm-hmm. and the Quickstep team or the Lotto Quickstep is actually the same team now. Um, the other you know um, uh, I actually don't know what uh, Sudal <laughs> Sudal Sudal exactly <laughs> um, the formerly known uh, Lotto <laughs> team. Um, they they got organized they had a couple of but they they you know they kept them at uh, at about a minute a minute 10 for for the longest time and uh, um so yeah that was that was amazing uh racing um and, and a small correction uh 
Stuart, you said the Pitcock van Aert, you know, crossing the line. Uh, that was actually the Amstel Gold race. Okay, my apologies. Mm-hmm. Right, and Pitcock st- still thinks that he won. He, he probably <laughs> did, right? But uh, um, uh, that was uh, the Amstel Gold race. Yes. Cool. And we're not done yet. So, you know, thinking about next week and next weekend. Um, yeah, we have we have Le Salmon on the uh, 28th. I think yep. that's Tuesday. Um, and then we have Strata on the 4th, which is Saturday. And that um, I, I think next weekend, next Sunday, we'll talk a lot. I know we'll talk a lot about the Strata, but I know we'll also talk about whether or not that is a is a monument. Um, man, it's one of the most beautiful races there is. It's one of the few where when it's on, I grab my wife and I say, honey, yes, it's another <laughs> bike race. It's on the television. But this one, you got to hang out and watch. And she does. It is. It yeah, is beautiful. It's, it's one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. And even the riders, they all love it too. The yeah, riders just yeah. they can't wait to do it, you know. Mm-hmm. And the 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 Italian, you know, broadcaster, the the camera work that they do is so epic. They they have mm-hmm. it nailed down. It's like just picture perfect, right? Even and preferably when it's dry and dusty, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Uh, compared to to rainy and slippery, um, I, I I like it to be dry and dusty. And then you know these shots are so epic. It's uh, you know if you if you haven't seen it, just go and watch it and and enjoy it. It's uh, it's such amazing racing. And you know this is the first classic that that Wout van Aert and Van der Poel will be there. Pogacar was supposed to be racing. He isn't. He will do uh, Paris-Nice. Um, so that's a three or four day stage event, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so, you know, that's 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 a shame. I would love to have seen these guys, you know, go at it. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Strade Bianchi, the, the epic finish in that in that that small town you know um mm-hmm. it's it's just beautiful mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. it is jerry uh, it's kind of a, a sidebar but a question for you you said something that that triggered this question up you said the italian broadcasters or the italian v- television crew so is there not like a uci television crew is this no. like an italian mm. racing television crew that films it and then provides them is that right Yes, correct. Okay, well that yeah. that makes sense then, because I I think that the Italian worlds was one of the most beautifully shot oh my gosh, worlds I've yes. ever seen. That that it's the same clip um of Ala Philippe um going along that ridge line. Yeah, the ridge yeah. line. Yeah, that was yeah. That as was well as the women's winner uh, the, the, the uh, as well going along. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was it Van der Breggen? No, Van Breggen. Van yep, 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 yeah. Van der Breggen. Yeah. Van the, Van the two of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. actually, I mean that that shot of Van der Breggen is one of the most yeah. her pedaling style in that shot specifically along that ridge line is like perfection it's goosebumps you know the italians uh, it's getting oh, goosebumps. they know how yeah. to make it beautiful <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <Much magnifico>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so that's that's next week so and then then you have parini and then tirreno adriatico you know so much beautiful racing uh racing mm-hmm. going on there okay. were a few other small races this yes. week. Um, a few one day. I know Ala Philippe did one. Yes. Um, there were a few others. Uh, a few other small one day races as well. But uh, we'll mainly stick to the the big ones. Absolutely. Okay. Um, good stuff. We have some technology updates for the listeners too. Jack, Jeff. J- Jerry, should we off. should we go to um local race about uh so Jeff can give us the local race news yes. since we're, yes, we're finishing uh, talking about races right now? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Sure. So, so this week we had an update from the race promoter uh, Gary Klein, who's going to be putting on the nationals at Bear Creek, and that's going to be July fifth through the ninth. So if anyone's planning to come out for that race, I would suggest you go ahead and book a room now. Um, he doesn't have the race itinerary, but if you look at past nationals, it'll probably follow the same format. So if you're racing cat one, cat two or juniors, um, look at what they've done previously. It's, it's going to be throughout the week. So it's either going to be that Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday when you're going to be racing. Um, the course is still being worked on, Mm -hmm. but the good news is they're having a race in June. At, at, uh, for the mass series 
and it's going to be the same course. So if we're Stuart and I were laughing, like it's probably going to be the biggest turnout mass race because <laughs> everyone wants to get a get a chance to preview. It's a preview, the, yeah, makes sense. I've actually heard the bookies are already starting to take as to if any of the big name pros will end up showing up and who they'll be. Yeah, it'll be it'll be good. They they did include the heckle pit, so yes. um, everyone loves that area. Mm -hmm. That's going to be in part of the race. But the um, uh, USAC has asked for them to include more of uh, open field shots so they can get video and mm -hmm. photo. Fin so they're going to be crossing the open fields a lot more than they have in years past. Um, so it's going to be fun. It's going to be a, a great event, and we're looking forward. Uh, they're going to give us more updates as um, the uh, course gets finalized. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and, and as soon as we learn more, we'll uh, we'll, we'll update everybody um, uh, along the way. And uh, um, you know, there's some work to do, but uh, um, they're starting early enough. So yeah, yeah. it will be amazing. Good to have it local. Yeah, exactly for sure. Yeah. Anything else on the on the local races, rides, front? Um, no, our next race will probably be the end of March, which will be the March Mayhem, the first mountain bike race um, right. of the H two H series. Uh, so that I don't see anything coming up between now and then, unless do you have anything planned, Stuart? No, I, I don't either. Yep. Yep. So we're still a month away. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, we'll be there before you know it. Um, yep. Uh, okay, cool. Um, and then uh, the, the tech horner. Sure. So let's start with, uh, we talked about it already, those helmets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you, if, if anybody saw them, the, 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 you know, X helmets. Were, yeah. And I think Jerry, you hit the nail on the head. It looks like the helmet from Spaceballs. It's really, they're abysmal looking. <laughs> um, but I think they're fascinating because what's happening here is, you know, before we had aero helmets. So the helmet itself. These helmets are doing is it's much like what they're doing in a Formula One aerodynamics. They're directing the airflow around, you know, a Formula One car has two things to do. It's direct, it, it's to reduce drag and to produce downforce. And, and obviously we're not worried about the downforce in, in cycling. We're not going that quite that fast yet. Um, but reducing drag is, is huge. And what the helmets are doing is it's altering the flow around the rider's body so that it's producing less turbulence as it goes over the rider's shoulders and, and, and backs. So why they, while they look absolutely horrific and, and, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want to be caught dead riding in, uh, in one of them, you have a, have my picture taken. Um, they're, they're, they're very effective. And like we said, they're, you know, they, they won the time trial by a second and, you know, you think back to the, the eight second win of Le Monde when he was the first to adopt the arrow bars and, and, uh, and an arrow helmet. And, uh, and, uh, you know, he wins over, over in 10, over 10 seconds versus Fignon, who is, has his blonde, long blonde ponytail wagging right. in the wind mm -hmm. and on traditional, uh, you know, a traditional, uh, handlebar. So, so yeah, it's, uh, I think it's the next stage and it, I'm, I'm, interesting to see what the UCI does with all of this right. um, because you know you, again you think back into the realm of Formula One with the regulations around what you can and can't do with the aero components right. of a car mm -hmm. in Formula One are we going to see the same thing starting to happen in in uh, in bicycle racing where you mm -hmm. know what where's the limit i mean what do you do with aero and what can't you do and i know there already you know uh, you know there already are some about you know how long your sock length can be and yeah, and and, sure. and mm -hmm. whatever so yeah it ought to be interesting to see how far you know how far the teams can take the aero and when and if the uh, uci steps in right. yeah I mean, Jack, 
Sorry, sorry, Jeff. Uh, to add on that, I mean the the UNOX helmets. Even Alexander Kristoff was wearing an old time trial helmet without the visor as his road helmet. He was wearing it in mm-hmm. a lot of the races right. this uh, yeah. recently. Yeah. So UNOX clearly is. Um, I don't know if at the forefront's the right, the right word, but they're definitely pushing the envelope. Right. Yeah. Some. The, so Marginal this time, games. if they get right. banned, we won't yeah. have to blame Matty Morich for something to get banned. It will be a, you know, X. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Right. 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 When I and when G- I when I saw that that helmet, which is not the same helmet, but I immediately thought about you know the time trial that uh, Roglic lost from Pogacar oh, yeah. with his visor and his helmet crooked. Right. On his right. Face. Crooked on <laughs> he his looked head. So right. sad. He looked so. Yeah. <laughs> right poor guy but yeah as a side note yes but yeah. go ahead jeff yeah yeah i was gonna say jack you'll be happy to know that there were several guys on the gravel ride today that were wearing uh aero helmets so oh, aero the gravel ride. Mm-hmm. oh my goodness yes Yikes. it's yeah. now made yeah, it to gravel well, yeah, now yeah. i have a specialized aero helmet does that count as an aero helmet absolutely absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, yeah. by the way, for um, unbound, you you can't use these um, you know bolt on tri bars anymore. Yeah. Right. Or maybe or maybe maybe the uh, the amateurs can and the, the amateurs can. quote amateurs unquote can. pros yeah. can yeah. can't right. So correct. Right. Yeah. For for things like that, I get it. It's the safety. Um, I mean, if somebody's down in their aero bars and yes. you're on gravel wash bar, you know, if they go sideways a little bit, they they can't grab brakes right away, and it's it's dangerous. Um, I don't know why it's not the amateurs. I think for the amateurs in those events, it's because those guys are going to be out there for 12, 15, 18 hours, right. mostly by themselves, so they need it. Um, but I get it with the pros. Yeah, it's still, you still, you know, uh, riding at 25, 26, 27 miles an hour. And if the half is on in the tri bars, and, you know, it takes a really small wave of the pack and you have a massive crash, right? And, you know, everybody gets faster and those groups get bigger in unbound then specifically. So it's, it's probably the right call. And besides the fact, you know, I think a lot of, you know, there were a lot of, uh, folks complaining uh, about it um, like a like it was an unfair advantage compared to the others that didn't you know choose to uh, to put those bars on but again we're uh, drifting away um, <laughs> so you know uh, the helmets uh, and anything else uh, yeah there was uh, you know, Shimano uh, submitted a really interesting patent for a three pulley derailleur um, with a very unorthodox chain routing where it, it actually goes through the the uh, the pulley system used to seeing. I mean, normally the chain goes through the uppermost pulley first and then exits the lower pulley. And in this one, you go through the lower pulley first and then go through the 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 upper pulley. Um, it's really interesting. It it, re- it results in a much shorter uh, derailleur hanger, uh, and and it looks like it might be able to eliminate the whole clutch mechanism, which adds friction uh, to mm-hmm. the to the drivetrain. I don't know if you guys saw that, but uh, mm-hmm. I, it looks like they're it, that's probably going to show up on mountain bikes. Mountain first, bikes first, right? First, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Looked really interesting to me. I mean, again, very different from from what we're used to seeing, but you love to see that type of uh, the innovation. And it's just a patent. Lord knows, mm-hmm. you know, when it might make it to uh, uh, production. But uh, they're obviously uh, thinking about things differently than 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 tradition. Yeah. My two senses: if Shimano makes it, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, 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 absolutely. yeah. And and there's other things that you know. The, another thing we saw in the tech news this week was a um, uh, a metal tire. Now think about that. Um, it actually was a technology that was d- developed by NASA for their Mars rovers, and it's a titanium um, alloy that deforms when necessary, but always remembers its shape. 
Right. So, and you think about what a tire does. I mean, it goes through the deformation process to uh, eliminate the bumps and whatever. But this is doing it with uh, with a you know very you know a, a very uh, uh, pedestrian uh, example. It looks like a spring. Right. Mm -hmm. and it looks like a spring and it deforms basically whenever it goes over any rough surfaces, um, but it always retains its memory and it always bounces back. So, and, you know, obviously no flat tires or anything of that nature. Now, you know, I, I looked into it as much as I could. It's still in the in the pre-revenue, pre-production stage, and it wasn't really clear how it would mount to an existing wheel and how they incorporate the rubber into it. You know, it's the, you know, they're advertising on the on their website that it is the you know, your last tire you'll ever buy. Well, obviously if there's rubber involved, rubber is going to wear. So there's got right. to uh, replace the rubber. And if it's an aftermarket, you somehow have to be able to mount this thing into a pre-existing, uh, you know, into a pre-existing wheel. But again, I found it pretty fascinating. I mean, just think, you know, you know, light, obviously, because it's it's mostly air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You can see right through the darn thing. It's mostly uh, it's it's mostly <laughs> air, um, no flats um, and 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 would probably have very low rolling resistance because the rolling resistance is uh, uh, would be phenomenal because of its of, of shock absorbing uh, capabilities right. on the on the road. You know, may, might not have the greatest rolling resistance on a super smooth uh, surface, but let's face it, most of our roads aren't super smooth. So the ability to absorb vibrations is uh, is actually more important from a rolling resistance perspective than than uh than just being able to ride over a smooth road yeah i wonder if this will first come to mountain bikes ah yeah again you know, wonder yeah or gravel yeah. or gravel for or that matter yeah or gravel you, you gravel know, have or, the, yeah the, the you know i could i could see it just as as an inner tube what's what's the the rubber called that you already can buy um for for gravel bikes or mountain bikes that the inserts can't think of the name oh right yeah yeah some yeah. of the in tire inserts um there's tire one inserts. by tubo light is one of the big ones vitoria right. is that what you're talking about yeah yeah yep. yeah basically uh like a you know what you use in the swimming pool also but then yep. small almost like a pool noodle a, yeah you have pool noodle. yeah exactly <laughs> And those do work. I mean, I raced last year in March um, out in Moab, did a three-day long stage race, a mountain bike race, and I was using exactly those, uh, the Vittoria tire inserts, and I was able to run 13 PSI in my front wheel and 16 in my rear wheel, and that's with those square edges where you're most vulnerable, and uh, man, they, they work well. So they'll have to figure out something like that to go in so you don't break those carbon fiber rims. Right, Yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll add the link um, in the in the notes uh, for, so everybody can uh, can see them because there's a lot of really neat information on that on that website which is actually um, it's called Start Engine so they use that to do some crowdfunding um, right. and this is the second round um, so it's basically their pitch uh, to 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 gather some funding yes. and. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and so. and the tire is called the Smart S M A R T tire. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And, the, and the, their cycling tire is called Metal M E T L. Yeah. So you know, Smart Tire Metal. That's their metal. their cycling because they're making it for more than just cycling. Yes. They're, they uh, also have automotive products as well. Yeah, I saw in there that Tesla um, was looking at it as well. Yeah. Within the next five years, they may incorporate it. So yeah. I know Jeff had to leave us, but I'm sure he uh, will be happy to hear that. <laughs> right. Okay. Then we had some – there is a, a new Swift companion app uh, coming. Uh, so finally, I think the main goal of that of the, the Swift companion app is, is to track your progress. So it will keep track of – your 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 personal koms mm -hmm. um so that's that's pretty neat um obviously they already had the the ghost avatar whether you do a sprint or when you do co complete route um you have your ghost avatar riding with you um and now in the companion app they're basically collecting uh, all your 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 leaderboards uh, which i think is, uh, is is pretty neat um as just as an additional uh, feature 
Yeah, and it also allows you to sort of you know search through the routes, uh, you know, the routes for each world. So it's a, a bit of what you get in Strava and a bit of what you get on Zwift Hacks, and uh, so it's nice to have it in the you know nice to have it all in the companion app. You don't have to go you know bouncing around a different site. So it is pretty handy. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And the the last topic um and then you know people can go out and watch it themselves so you know dc rainmaker you know the guy who somewhat picked a fight with uh with strava which <laughs> you know yeah. kind of caused the ceo uh, to to leave um he <laughs> did a very very extensive i think he, he said eight months or something yeah uh yeah. test for the the jurys so the top of the bill <laughs> you know you can't get any better uh, power meter which is just way off um and yeah, 20 uh, watts off on the small yeah. ring yeah and it's only wow. on the small ring but it's 20 watts consistently 20 watts off overstated so right. if you're you know you're you're it reads 20 watts higher than anything else he calibrated with it and it was consistent in the small ring hmm. right yeah so that's uh that's that's not good um and uh you know he's very obviously has been doing this for a long long time and he you know he 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 does you know knowing power meters like he does he's saying i i, I don't have a clue how they can fix this right that's that's mm -hmm. how, how do you fix besides developing a, a new one but how do you fix an existing power meter which is so much off mm -hmm. that's it's not do you guys just know updating the firmware or anything yeah. Did they buy Pioneer um, Shimano and did they take the Pioneer technology to first use the, the generation that we're talking about before this newest generation? Is that right? I'm not sure. I, yeah. I, I, think, I do think they ended up buying yeah, a, a Pioneer, uh, but I'm, I'm not asking sure if that's this, this power meter though. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and it seems like the the pro teams have known about this for a while because you know you could spot the pro teams having a, you know different power meters on their you know Dura Ace equipped bikes and and obviously why would you go to the you know go to the trouble of having a duplicative power meter on your bike and it's obviously because they kind of knew it was wrong it was right. in, in, it was inaccurate so they needed accurate uh, statistics right. Yeah. yeah, and especially because these pros, especially the new generation, they they ride by looking at their power meter because they exactly know what they can do. Mm -hmm. And if your power meter is twenty watts off, that's that's a big difference. Yeah, that is even difference. for the, yeah. these pro guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was pretty shocking <laughs> to see that that was in the Endura Ace. Uh, yeah, that's the top of the line equipment. You do, would not expect. Have that level of inaccuracy in a in a wow. dual base product. Cool. So, okay. yeah. Uh, Stuart, was there anything else that um, you wanted to to bring up? No, I I think we kind of uh, might have ran out of time about talking about Yumbo Visma, or I know we talked about them a lot, but we were going to chat a little bit about how dominant they are. Right. I don't know if we have enough time to do that right now, but uh, for those of you guys interested, they do have a mini series on Amazon about Yumbo Visma. Yep. Um, but bottom line, Yumbo Visma is doing everything right. Right, exactly. Yeah, um, you know, we 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 did want to talk about recovery a little bit um and again the recovery and and training that's that's a topic that we can fill a whole podcast on i, I do want to touch a little bit because you said Stuart, you um you, you're looking at uh, you know building in some recovery mm -hmm. um then the this next coming week, week. Or, yeah exactly so you know if i if i quickly go over basically a top 10 of things that you need to take in account for for recovery um you know one it starts with reducing your intensity um and it could be from from a volume and or an intensity point of view right so um i usually recommend a three to one schedule which is then the basis of your recovery so you increase your volume and or intensity over the course of three weeks and then followed by a week of recovery where you then again lower uh, that intensity and, and and volume 
Um, and if you maintain that gradually over time, over months, you still have that increase, but you're letting your body recover every um, three weeks. Um, and when you let your body recover, that's really where the magic happens because um, the human body um, and, and, and your physiology, you know, you, you always adapt um, uh, to whatever strain you are giving your body, right? So for example, if you always ride consistently the same lap, yes, you will get better. But at some point, your body adapts to that strain and you won't see any improvements anymore. And you, you could even say that over time, you will get start uh, get to start go slower and slower and slower because your body is so well um, uh, adapted to that 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 strain. Um, so you need to you know you need to shock the system and uh, um, you know increase the intensity, uh, do VO two max, um, have specific training blocks in order to. Uh, to make yourself to make yourself better uh, but you know going into a recovery week really reduce the intensity and the volume of training during that uh, that week now during that week is it i do a lot of weightlifting anyways is it okay if i do one extra weight session if my time on the bike and my intensity on the bike is both decreased but i do instead of two lifting sessions i do three lifting sessions no but- you know, lifting is is very dependent on the time of the season. So in in you know preseason, you you usually do your lifting, but the recovery week is really a recovery week. Okay. So what you can do uh, in a recovery week is you can do active recovery, right? So you can you do low intensity activities like yoga, walking, maybe a little bit swimming, really to keep the blood flowing um, yes. and to speed up the recovery. But especially lifting, that's just putting a lot of additional strain. Your the, the micro tears in your muscles um, uh, that 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 really happens um, uh, even more with uh, with with lifting. Okay. So um, so should lifting, I go although, down to one lifting session during a recovery week instead yes, of two? Y- okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, or maybe do a little bit of uh, body weight, uh, core stability, a little bit of extra core stability. You know equal to to yoga type of uh, type of work but um um so that's uh, you know um uh, active recovery is part of that obviously adequate rest um but you know getting enough sleep uh, is crucial for recovery but you don't have to wait until your recovery week to get some good sleep in so <laughs> you know on average um, and I know you, 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 you get by with a little bit less sleep, uh, um, and it's it's different per person. But for the most people, you know, getting between seven and nine hours sleep per night, uh, that's that's really preferable. Um, nutrition, right? Again, something that you have to keep in uh, keep keep in check all the time. Uh, but um, uh, during your recovery week, you do need to think about. Okay, when I do long rides, when I do high intensity type of workouts, I, I probably need a little bit more calories, right? So if your let's say your average is two thousand calories, that's just your your base metabolic rate is two thousand calories. When you add your rides and your workouts to that, you need twenty five hundred, or you need three thousand, or sometimes even more calories uh, to 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 balance that. Um, when you do nothing, or maybe um, uh, just some active recovery, um, if you keep on eating 3,500 calories, <laughs> right, <laughs> you're eating probably a little bit too much. So you know, adjust your nutrition uh, throughout your um, uh, recovery week. Um, so you, you're basically getting closer to your your break even metabolic rate. Um, so keep that uh, keep that in mind, but. Uh, do keep uh, uh, your your macros or your protein, your carbs, your healthy fats um, in in good uh, good balance. What does Thank wonders? You. Yeah, what does wonders is getting a massage. Um, I know you you do that uh, quite often, uh, but you know uh, tights or muscles again increasing the blood flow, reducing inflammation, um, and and it's it's very very relaxing. So you know if you have have a good massage therapist. I would highly encourage doing that. 
And then you have hydration. So in addition to your nutrition, make sure that you really drink enough water. Um, and make sure that you uh, do that. Um, doing compression, ice baths, stretching. Um, and really, you know, I think the most important thing is take time to listen to your body. Maybe even do some meditating, right? Really take that time in the in your recovery week to listen to your body, pay attention how you feel, um, and uh, uh, maybe adjust your recovery uh, by adding a day or reducing another uh, with a, with a day, uh, depending on how you feel. Thank you. So, so those would be my uh, my my tips for uh, you know. Um, recovery. Uh, so I home. shouldn't go hit the gym and then go to the bar. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. That's uh, that's uh, you will achieve Noted. the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Good stuff. So you know, we um, and my apologies. I, uh, I I basically ran into the podcast because I was so excited about all the racing <laughs> and all the cool technology uh, stuff yeah. that we had. So I didn't start off with kind of laying out the topics, but you know, if I would summarize what we discussed, we, we talked about the racing, uh, from, from last week. Um, so talking about the, the tour, the UAE, uh, the spring classic and a couple of other races, uh, we had some, uh, really cool stuff around, uh, uh, the technology uh, with uh, with the helmets and mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, Swift. Um, we talked about the XC Nationals, um, and now we ended with the uh, with the recovery. Um, so I, you know, a little bit uh, longer uh, podcast than than usual. Um, I think uh, we uh, we uh, had a, a good set of topics. Um, mm -hmm. So great set of topics this week. A lot going and, on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more uh, more to come uh, next week. Um, thanks, Jack, Stuart, yeah. uh, Jeff, um, and uh, we'll talk to you again uh, next week. Um, yeah. Same time, same place, and uh, have a great uh, the rest of your week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. See you next Take week. Care. Okie dokie. I actually Great. don't know when when uh, Jeff uh, left. I had, was looking at my notes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure either. He's I, right around. Actually, it was right around six o'clock. He ducked oh, out. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, probably yeah. Is, uh, yeah, the, the eating time. And I'll I'll yeah. tweak the, the the end uh, a little bit um, by by cutting it out. Um, yeah, yeah. We talked a lot about the races, so that was uh, I yeah. think that was cool. It was pretty pretty fluent. Um, you know, um, kind of handing over. Um, and uh, uh, having com complimentary, um, you know, comments. Um, so that was good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any anything else? No, I th I think we're kind of all finding our flow together. I think it's um, each one's getting a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay, um, and it works well with the. Um, the podcast notes right so everybody is adding yeah, their, their own really, comments that, and that really helps that, yeah. that already starts you know mm -hmm. helping you to prepare and 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 so so we're able to talk to 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 these topics a little bit more more fluently uh by by doing that so i think that's uh that's that's helpful that so you know we'll keep we'll keep on doing that yep yeah and i Great. think as the racing season gets on we'll be able to cover more of the the, the key races Right. Because some of the little ones kind of go away when the seasons really starts to get rolling. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah there's there's not yeah. not enough time anymore for these, and unless something yeah. really exciting happens or, you know, what have you. But you know the, you know, if you only look at uh, next week with Tata Bianchi, I mean, it's it's it's, it's a, actually a really nice race. But then you already have Paris Nice uh, starting, so yeah, there's there's a uh, there's a lot going on. Yeah, With how much we're talking, we might need more than one po podcast a week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One for local racing, one for national racing, right, one for right. news, yeah. one for coaches' corner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if you listen to uh, uh, the Move podcast, so the, the 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 new guy, his name is Spencer or something, and he Spencer he, Martin. Yeah, he he joined the team and he had a a podcast by himself but he he doesn't have a it doesn't feel that he has a cycling background just like the other 
co-host doesn't have a huh. true cycling background and you just notice when he talks about certain thing that he that he that he really doesn't understand the cycling dynamics or um and then he starts to get a little bit argumentative with Brunel sometimes and they think mm. Mm, okay this guy has got you know he's it, you're you're on the earth and he is on you know the sun kind of looking at experience and he's trying to argue with with Brunel right if we argue you know it's somewhat of a peer to peer <laughs> right yeah, so it's a little yeah, bit yeah. awkward that's uh, that's uh I don't know if if it's the right chemistry. Um, and then then Lance Armstrong isn't on the podcast anymore. I, I don't know. Hmm. Let's see. It's good for us. Where'd Lance go? I think he has got a ton of other stuff to do. He probably will pop up when, you know, yeah, maybe when Strada Bianchi, the yeah, really yeah, big yeah, races yeah, yeah. or Tour de yeah. Flanders, stuff like that. But, you know, this is kind of, you know, he's probably uh, his, his more important thing to do. Yeah. Yep. We'll, we'll we'll take a, a share of his uh, <laughs> audience. No worries. Yeah. What okay. what, uh, what? How many did our last uh, episode get? How many listens? Um. So, I think we are at a at at a hundred for the first week, which is pretty good. Um. And uh, the nice thing is that the the first couple of days. You know, it was a really, you know, a really good spike of of downloads, um, and I think that's just a good indication of that people are are listening and um, downloading the podcast as soon as it comes out, and that that really, you know, with with, with putting out this this podcast consistently is um, um, is is helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know. Hopefully we can chip away and get a couple of users of users, yeah. uh, uh, mm -hmm. listeners each yeah, and every yeah. time, and and then then grow and and that's also um, the uh, the the reviews. So that's why I said you know go on Apple Podcast yourself and ask your your wife and friends and leave us a five star review mm -hmm. right when we get twenty five five star reviews or a fifty. Um, I think that 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 really helps to kind of you know bump mm -hmm. you up uh, the list of uh of, of podcasts and, and then will this one also be going on youtube yeah yeah i'll Great. i'll uh i'll do that yep good because i showered today just just for that <laughs> <laughs> oh i was looking hey yeah. hey jack where's your background from uh that is from colorado do you know where uh yeah that was outside of um Steamboat Springs on the way to from Steamboat Springs to um uh what's the name of the pass that's right outside of Steam Oh Rabbit Ears there last summer. So I'll 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 figure it out and let I'll let you know. I'll Is it Rabbit it. Ears? Uh it's not you know, no, it's not Rabbit Ears. Okay. Oh well, yeah. all good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, I too got a boogie, go up and grab dinner with the with the family, but great session, guys. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. Good great. stuff. Good. Have a great one. All Bye. Right. See ya. Bye. -bye.